Right you are. Um, the history of Norwegian art, and really what we're looking at, of course, is the history of 19th century Norwegian art, which is worth um, making the point. Uh, this is really is the background to Astrup, because um, looking at the Astrup show, I think everyone kind of thinks, well, he looks sort of unique. He's come out of nowhere. We've only ever heard of Munch anyway. Um, but of course he doesn't, and uh, the 19th century in Norway is a, is a sort of golden age of, of Norwegian art, and many of the themes that Astrup is using come from that. And so it's worth, it's worth looking at, and we, I've started with Scream, just because that's kind of the be-all and end-all of what most people know about Norwegian art. And um, I think Munch has kind of blown everyone else out of the water to a certain extent because of his international reputation. He, he was more of a, um, a businessman, I think, in many ways, despite the absinthe and uh, mental health problems. He, he had a wide uh, international patronage, and so he is more famous and, of course, lived a lot longer, which is worth bearing in mind. I mean, he was born 11 years before Astrup and dies in 1944. So he had more, a, a, a longer run at it. Um, this is the kind of classic uh, image for the Freudian age, I think. Um, it's, it's where we kind of look inwards at the, uh, at the psycho, psycho aspect of things. Um, but it is a fjord picture. That's the Oslo fjord in the background there. And in that sense, it's part of the, the broader sense of um, Norwegian art. Um, and it's also a mood piece uh, in that it's very, uh, a very distinctive mood piece. Uh, I also like to just draw attention that my, uh, I certainly for years have got this painting completely wrong because I assumed we had a kind of Macaulay Culkin moment here of a person in the front screaming, you know, kind of, ah! and that's not what's happening. And here is what Munch says about it. One evening I was walking along a path. The city was on one side and the fjord below. I felt tired and ill. I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turned blood red. I sensed a scream passing through nature. It seemed to me that I heard the scream. I painted this picture, painted the clouds as actual blood. The color shrieked. This became the scream. In other words, it's the landscape that's screaming. And uh, the figure in the foreground is, is, is merely kind of suggesting horror at what he's hearing in the landscape. Now this, again, 1890s, this is 1893. Munch is, is uh, suffering from various kind of mental health problems from over drinking and all the rest of it. So uh, that's what this painting is about. And it's a turning point in art for that reason, really. So, but he's not alone. Um, this is also 1893, and this is the wonderful Harold Solberg, um, who is, again, older than Astrup. He's from the, the generation just previous. And yet he's painting in the same kind of color scheme, this night glow from 1893. Very uh, dramatic, very individual, uh, doesn't look like anybody else. Screaming colors. But this, of course, is, again, this is entirely about mood. It's heightened color to suggest um, an, an evening and a particular mood in the landscape. It's not projecting a kind of psycho mood on it at all. So it's, in, it's symbolist rather than expressionist. So, right, we're going to start, we we'll have a short history lesson because it's relevant, but I'll give you something to look at. The most beautiful museum, one of the most beautiful museums in the world in Oslo, the, the three Viking ships. That's the Gokstad ship on the left and uh, the carving, the front, it, it's actually been removed from the, the head of the ship. They were removable, usually, from the Osberg ship. And these were burial ships that were dug up in the 19th century and are incredibly beautiful. And the Viking Age is important as, as a kind of precursor of what we're looking at here, so not because of the beauty of the objects. I mean, this is, one of the, this is one of the most exquisite objects that mankind has ever produced, I think, in terms of decorative arts but really um, because it was a period of unification. The country was, Norway was a, was a whole at that point. It was united under the Vikings. And this is an important thing. Um, the Vikings, of course, were Christianized in the, in the 11th century. And then in the 12th century, the age of the Norwegian kings was, was memorialized by <laughs> the wonderfully named Snorri Sturluson, who was an Icelandic poet and politician who wrote the um, sagas, the Icelandic sagas. And he wrote um, the history of the Norwegian kings. And so 
the Norwegians have this clear idea of a period in history when they were A, great, B, invading everybody else, and C, producing fantastic art. But they were all unified. So it's important for the Norwegian psyche generally. Then the history, the quick history lesson is that Norway entered um, a union, the Kalmar Union it was called, with Denmark and Sweden in 1397. Sweden kind of absconded in 1523, leaving Norway with Denmark. And Norway was always the junior partner in this whole period because they were poorer. It's a difficult country to earn a living in, all those fjords. It's really hard. And that's why the Vikings invaded England. Much easier to live in England. So um, they were under rule of a king in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And Danish was the written language of Norway from the 16th to the 19th centuries. And in the 19th centuries, a Dano-Norwegian language called Reichsmål was developed, which Astrup was taught because it was, the, it was the language of the church and the state. So Danish loomed large right over into the 19th centuries. But in 1814, they were handed over by Denmark to Sweden again. Norway erupted at this point, and Norway declared independence. They weren't too pleased with that. But Sweden dealt with that just by occupying them. And so from 1814 until 1905, Norway was part of Sweden. And again, the poor partner in that relationship. And that's, that's what all this is about. Um, Norway was struggling to identify itself against a kind of foreign, not oppressor, but they felt like the junior partner always. Um, the lesson here, I always think, with um, there was a referendum in 1905 in Norway asking people, did they want to stay in, with Sweden or did they want to become independent? And the vote for staying with Sweden was 184 people. <laughs> I don't know why they bothered, really. But anyway, they then appointed a Danish king from the, the, the royal family in Denmark, a junior prince, Prince Karl, who became King Hakon. And so the, the, Dan the Norwegian royal family is actually based from the, the Danish royal family. So there you have it. It's a country with identity issues, effectively. And the 19th century, in terms of art, is very much a search for a kind of national identity. It's part of this whole business of crawling their way out to become an independent country. Now, there's one other aspect of the history lesson that I need to get over, which is relevant, which is the, the teaching of art in, in Norway. Um, until 1909, there was no national academy for the arts in Christiania, as Oslo was then known, or Bergen. Um, there was a royal school of drawing um, in Oslo, I'll call it Oslo from now on, in, in Oslo, but it, it really taught technical drawing and it was aimed at architects, designers, that kind of thing. But that was the only thing that you could go to. And Astrup enrolled there for about two weeks, basically. Uh, and thereafter moved on to another form of learning, but he, he went there for evening classes in, in printmaking. So that's the kind of place th that it was. But this means that there, uh, a different pattern of learning how to paint, how to be an artist, develops in Norway in the 19th century. And it's absolutely clear throughout the century, it involves travel. Effectively, you had to move out of Norway. There were schools, individual artists, we'll see two of them, um, Johann Frederick Eckersberg and Harriet Becker, set up local art schools in Oslo, and they were good, they were quite good. Uh, Knud Bergslin, who took over um, uh, Eckersberg's school in 1870. These three names really taught a, a whole generation of, of artists, but the feeling was that that wasn't enough, and so they traveled. And you can see why many of them, from the political history, you can see why many of them went to Denmark. Because Denmark still felt like, you know, the older brother. And it had a golden age of painting, furthermore, and it had an academy. And so many people went to, to Copenhagen for an advanced training. But really the standard place to go was Germany. And Germany had several academies, several great academies. Um, and consequently, the Norwegians are all very well trained either Dusseldorf, Munich, Dresden, or Berlin, Karlsruhe. Um, they, they all, many of them stayed in Germany. Some of, some of the great Norwegian artists are actually effectively German because they lived in Germany most of their lives, if not all of their lives. 
Later on in the century, uh, artists would go on to Paris because Paris looms, obviously, Impressionism and all the rest of it. And so Paris enters the mix as well. And it's, this is why Astrup, Astrup is actually rather classic in this regard. He studied in Oslo with Harriet Backer, um, who set up her own school there. And then he does, on, he does an art tour. He gets a travel scholarship and he goes to Germany and he tours the great cities in Germany, studies the art at the academies, and then ends up in Paris, because he's later in the century, of course. And he joins uh, the, the Colorossi Academy for a few months. So he is following in the footsteps of all the other artists at that point. It's an entirely normal thing for him to have done. And here's the first. This is, he's known as the father of Norwegian painting. This is Johan Christian Dahl who is uh, 18th century in birth. He was 1788, but died in 1857 um, from very humble stock. His father was actually a fisherman. And he studied in, in Bergen, um, again, with a, a very small school, um, it was a bloke called Muller uh, in the early days, but it was more of a kind of decorative, you know, sign painting um, uh, business. And you, there are some very early paintings by Dahl in that style, and they're pretty crude. But he also was much better than, the, than his teacher very quickly and felt he was being exploited. So he moves on and he goes to Copenhagen in 1811. Good date for Dulwich Picture Gallery. Moves to Copenhagen to the Academy where he sees Rysdale and Everdingen. And Everdingen is, is a 17th century Dutch artist who is significant because he painted, he came to Norway and he painted waterfalls. And it's through Everdingen that Rysdale, who we know well from our gallery, painted waterfalls as well. As far as we know, Rysdale never clapped eyes on a waterfall, but he'd seen them in Everdingen. So that's, that's the significance there. Dahl held that landscape painting should not just depict a specific view, um, but that it should say something about the land's nature and the character and its history, its past, and the life and work of its current inhabitants. And I chose this one uh, for, for that reason because it's a very picturesque and beautiful image. Uh, Norwegian mountains, waterfalls, we see all those in Astrup. But he's also focused on the very particular vernacular ar architecture, the turf roofs, um, the, the fences, all of these are in Astrup as well. The boat, which um, you know, is apparently a modern boat but looks decidedly like um, a Viking ship to me, to indicate something of the, of the past. And in the, in the distance there, that little um, farmstead, it's a, it's a society of, of really hard-working farmstead communities. You have noticed, those of you who've noticed the, in Astrup, the um, grain poles. You've got a field full of grain poles there. And at this point in the Romantic age, because this is romantic painting, grain poles look more like kind of besieging armies than trolls, but um, that was just dull. And all of this was based on a really astounding study of nature. Dahl's um, uh, sketches and this painting of a tree in a storm, highly romantic but utterly extraordinary in technique. I mean, slightly out of focus, I think, but it's amazing to look at. Every leaf is there. Um, and that is the basis of Dahl's work. He went to Dresden in 1818 and dies in Dresden in 1857. So he is effectively part of the German Dresden School of Painting, and that is Caspar David Friedrich. It's a great name in romantic German painting. And they became friends. In fact, um, the two families moved in together at one point to live together. Now, Dahl is significant because he sets another pattern, which is that although he's based in Germany, he visits Norway in the summers and goes on really quite grueling um, hiking tours, effectively, in the fjords and mountains of Norway for subject matter. And that's what he's looking for. So he is there in 1826, in 1834, 1839, 1844, and 1850. And he gathers all of that material. And although he's based in Dresden, he is one of the founding fathers of the National Gallery in Oslo. And so he is a hugely important person. This guy is as well. This is Hans Gouda, who I absolutely adore. And Hans, Hans Gouda, and not so much this painting actually, but this is a rather typical seascape by Hans Gouda. And you can see the, the elements of his work. It's still romantic in the, these wonderful details, this kind of misty 
um, aerial perspective in the background, the light on the water. The control of tone and, and image is just extraordinary. Um, the, the light in a Hans Gouda painting is, is always a, a miracle of, of virtuoso technique. He had a very long career, he was born in 1825, um, and his significance, he's one of these artists who taught. Um, and there are a lot of artists in the history of art who are almost more significant for the fact that they were great teachers than for what they actually produced. And Gouda, I think, is one of them. I mean, his paintings are wonderful too, but the fact is virtually every artist went through him at one point or another because he was professor at uh, Dusseldorf, he moved to Karlsruhe, he went to Berlin, and he was um, professor at all three of those academies at various times. And it's like this stream of Norwegian artists passing through Germany and on to Paris and then back to Norway. And when Gouda moves from, from Dusseldorf to, to Berlin or uh, Karlsruhe, the stream diverts suddenly to Karlsruhe. And so he taught a whole generation of artists, and he's highly influential on the American sublime school as well. Because the other thing one has to remember is that American painters, the American painters like Frederick Church and all of that school of art, go to Germany too. And so did Lauren Harris, who you might remember from um, the Painting Canada. Lauren Harris doesn't train in Paris, he trains in Germany. Um, I think we tend to forget how important Germany was for art in the 19th century particularly. Um, early in his career, uh, Gouda didn't have the um, confidence to paint figures. And so he, he um, collaborated with this guy called Adolf Tiedemand. And this is one of Norway's kind of national icons. And it is a truly exquisite painting um, for the landscape, primarily. Tiedemand, I find a little kind of lumpen. Um, but the landscape, this stuff up here, the, the snow on the top, this drift of cloud, the light on the mountains, has to be seen to be believed. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful painting, really glorious control. Um, but of course, it's very famous because it, this shows a bridal procession on the Hardanger Fjord. And so, we, if you remember the, the, the various opening, there's a lot of talk about the Hardanger fiddle. And uh, in the bonfire paintings by Astrup, the figure playing the violin, this is a Hardanger fiddle. It's the kind of classic folk instrument um, with a wonderful noise. So there's a fiddle player here, um, because this is Hardanger, this is whence the, the fiddle came, but they're firing guns, and the, bri the bride there, the cat that got the cream, just there, very smug looking expression on her face, um, stave church in the background. Uh, she's wearing a crown, which is also part of the, the whole bridal thing in, in Norway, and you can see these in the Museum of Decorative Arts. They were often very valuable, these crowns. They were silver, wonderful, from dangling with glass and, and, and uh, wonderful decorative detail. And uh, any district in Norway would have a crown held by the mayor or the local council or whoever the head man in the village was, um, and it would be lent out to brides on, on their wedding day. It's rather better than the usual white meringue, I think, probably, in my humble opinion. Um, and here he is, Gouda, again, demonstrating this extraordinary uh, ability to observe nature. And I've chosen this one uh, because it is very, it's a small painting. I mean, this is it huge, but it's actually rather a tiny painting, a mill pond. And wonderful, wonderful detail of light and water and all the rest of it. But it's this rock that's so astounding, with the lichen and moss on it. And you will notice, in, again, in Astrup, there are one or two rocks like this. Um, he he uh, is following in Gouda's footsteps in no uncertain terms. It was, a, it was a test, really, for a Norwegian artist, getting a rock like that right. No one did it better than Gouda. I mentioned Eckersberg earlier. I'm just including one painting by him. Um, he uh, is quite a significant artist. He's not, he's not as great as Gouda, I don't think. Um, but he was noted for his uh, landscapes, and he was a, he's a prominent figure because he's a teacher, he sets up the school in Oslo, in the transition from romanticism to, to a more realistic approach. And realism often involves actually a closing in of focus. And so suddenly the, the army of grain poles is, is closer up. And eventually, of course, with Astrup and Kittelsen, you get, um, they come so close that they turn into trolls. 
At this distance, they still look a bit like an army. But it's really um, a, a rather nice realistic landscape. And Thomas Fernley is another. Um, he was the foremost of uh, Dahl's pupils, and actually his dates show that he's, he's earlier than the, the, the two I've just shown you. Um, Thomas Fernley sounds like he should have been born in Barnsley, but actually he is Norwegian, and Fernley is a good Norwegian name, I can't think why. Um, this is Balastrand, which is in the same sort of area as Astrup comes from. It's in western Norway, just, just Balastrand is just below Jølster. And um, you can see that they're choosing uh, subject matter that is specifically Norwegian. So this, is, this could not be mistaken for just an alpine landscape. The snow on the, on the mountains in the background, the melting snow is very typical. For some reason, Norway tends to look like that, particularly in the summer months. The snow hangs on throughout, and you see that patterning in Astrup all the time. But this is, what he's doing here is looking at the Stave Church. The Stave Church is, there at this date, um, Stave Church were, were, were beginning to be rebuilt and torn down. And there were a few that survived. And in the 1840s, um, people start to save Stave Churches. And so there are a handful of them still uh, around Norway. And they are remarkable. I mean, it, looks, it feels like you're walking into an upturned Viking ship. It's, they're quite remarkable. So he's, he's evoking the history here. I like, I should just say, I, what I love about Thomas Fernley is that um, he met uh, Dahl. Uh, he studied in Copenhagen, inevitably, but he, he, he met Dahl on one of uh, Dahl's hiking trips in, a, in 1926, and then moved to Dresden and then, then Munich. And Dahl was a good friend of Fernley's, but he disapproved, interestingly, of his theatricality. And I, I've always liked the fact, I mean, I slightly disapprove of, of Fernley's <laughs> theatricality as well. He, he goes in for sort of dazzling light effects and all the rest of it. But um, I rather like the fact that Fernley used to sign himself as the professor of theatrical effects in landscape painting when he was writing to Dull. Um, he traveled quite widely. Funnily enough, he, he made it to Switzerland and he even made it to the Lake District, the height of Britain's uh, sublime. Um, and to London, but he died very young. Uh, he died of um, typhoid in 1842, so it's a, a career cut short, even younger than Astrup. And this, you might have come across, Peder Balke, another uh, pupil of Dahl's, uh, 1804 to 1887. And Peder Balke has just, in the last couple of years, had an exhibition at the National Gallery, and he has been turning up in, um, in uh, uh, art shows, uh, commercial art shows in this country for a while, uh, the art dealers have suddenly noticed him. And I think there's a sort of popularity there because people can grasp the virtuosity, this kind of dazzling virtuoso effect. I mean, it doesn't bear much analysis, this painting, because that mountain um, is truly gigantic. I mean, it's completely out of all proportion. So it's, it's a kind of sublime dream landscape, <clears throat> in a way. And that's his great um, addition to, the, to Norwegian art. It's, it's pure romanticism, um, but also uh, there's, a, there's a, a level of eccentricity there, um, which is important in considering, say, Astrup later on. Um, this sense of being able to develop a completely individual, quirky style <clears throat> that actually, funnily enough, appeals to the modern eye very, very much, like, say, Constable Sketches or something like that. Um, we, pr we, we like this kind of thing, and we can appreciate it. It's, not a, it's an interesting story, Peter Balker. He had some success. He was patronized by the King of France, by Louis-Philippe of France, um, who commissioned 30 paintings for the Louvre, but then, of course, he, um, in the, the February Revolution, actually, <laughs> cut that. Um, project short, and it was never completed. And eventually he returns uh, to Oslo in 1850 um, and becomes, he, his reputation as an artist sort of disappears. And w what he's known as now, funnily enough, is a social reformer because he built a, a suburb um, in Oslo, still there, called Balkaby, <laughs> um, named after himself, obviously with improved living conditions for workers. And so that's kind of what's on his gravestone. 
people forgot he, he was a painter at all. But, and so he was a highly respected citizen, but not a respected artist, which is rather odd. But it meant that he, um, he falls out of the, um, the art circle, but carries on painting in this extraordinary kind of monochrome, um, bizarre style, and is now being recognized, and I quote, by the National Gallery as one of the forerunners of modernism. Kinda. But I'll tell you who the real forerunner of modernism was. There you go, Caspar David Friedrich, who'd been doing this kind of thing long before, um, in 1824. And that, that, that is a radical painting. Now, talking about radical paintings, Lars Herterwig. I love Lars Herterwig. I feel like he's kind of like, he's sort of like, I don't know, Samuel Palmer on magic mushrooms or something. He's com completely bonkers. And I, it's an unfortunate thing to have said because, in fact, he did suffer from mental health problems. Um, Lars Herterweg was born in, um, near Stavanger, and he studied in, in Oslo at the Royal School of Drawing, and then to Hans Gude in Dusseldorf. So he follows the, he follows the right paths. Um, he's, he's in Dusseldorf in 1852, but in 1854, shows signs of mental health problems. And he's actually committed to an, an insane asylum, which was no one's idea of a picnic in 1854, believe me, for 18 months. Um, and then returned to, as it were, the custody of, of his family in Stavanger thereafter. But from there until the end of his life, and, and you know, he lives until 1902, um, he is described as incurably insane. Um, but there was no difference in, in his painting between the periods when he was supposed to be sane and the periods when he's supposed to be insane. And he carried on painting throughout. And of course, one has a slight distrust of any kind of sweeping generaliz generalization like incurable insanity in the 19th century. Maybe it was just something perfectly ordinary, he just didn't know what it was. But uh, he was certainly able to paint. And in the 1860s, this is uh, when he's incurably insane, is his particularly valued period. And I've got this one here um, from 1867. His paintings have this curious um, dreamlike quality, the stacks of clouds, uh, just the interesting take on the landscape that he has. They don't look like anyone else. And here's another. This is known as his Blonde Fjord period, uh, 1865. And again, it looks like something primeval from when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I think. So, moving to something completely different. Um, we move into a new phase of Norwegian art, and I'm representing it with just one painting, really, here. This is Christian Krog, and Christian Krog is important because, A, he taught Astrup at the Academy Colorossi, so he is an important person in Astrup's career, but he's an important person in all sorts of ways. He's rather remarkable. I like Christian Krogh. I don't like all of his paintings. This is a wonderful thing, though. He really brings social realism into the mix. He's a, he's a realist painter, and he, he's interested in, realist, in, in social conditions. He wrote a famous novel called Albertine, which is about you know, a young, innocent woman who is forced into prostitution um, and her story. Uh, and it was con confisc confiscated by the police. It was considered completely scandalous. And uh, his biggest painting in the National Gallery of Oslo shows a scene from that, uh, from that book with Albertine in a, in a kind of waiting room at the police station with all of these kind of blousy um, prostitutes all overdressed and over made up with flowers in their hats and all the rest of it. And she's standing there looking like the, the, the young woman to the side of the Astrup bonfire with the, with the headscarf. This is clearly a picture of innocence in, in Norwegian art um, waiting to be shown into the police, into the police room for, for investigation. So he's an important figure. Um, he w was in uh, Paris, actually, because his famously um, <laughs> uh, bohemian wife, Oda, who is also a very good painter, incidentally, look her up, Oda Krog. Um, and she had many lovers, Oda. And uh, she followed one of them to Paris, and Krog packed up and went after her and got a job as professor at the Colorossi. Brought her back, I might add, um, to Oslo. She came back with him in the end. 
Um, but that's why he was there, and it happened to coincide with Astrup's um, visit there. But he also um, becomes the first professor of the Royal Academy of Art in 1909 when it was founded in Oslo. So he is significant. If you go to Oslo, there's a, a large um, statue of him sitting, looking plump and bearded uh, in, in Oslo for that reason. So an important man. And uh, a friend of Eilif Pettersson, I, I put this in really almost representing Krogh because um, this is a, a painting done at Skagen. Skagen is uh, the northernmost point of Denmark. And it was very readily accessible from Norway. And it has a school of painters. It's, it's the Denmark equivalent of St. Ives, I suppose. Um, it had a school of painters, and they paint the sea and this beautiful white beach. Um, a fisherman, that kind of thing. And this is a classic example. I have no idea what those four men are looking for out to sea. But anyway, there's clearly something fascinating out there. And Eilif Pettersson will come across later as well. But uh, this is, represents a period when realism mixes with the Denmark school at this point. This is Gerard Munter. Now, we're kind of skipping through famous names in Norwegian art here, but they are all remarkable painters. And uh, Munter did the usual thing. He studied with Eckersberg and Bergslin in, in Oslo, um, the local artist school, and then went to Dusseldorf with guess who and Skude. Munich, uh, where there was, um, there was a, an actual kind of group of Norwegian artists working at that time. And he, uh, he is interested in Norwegian motifs. And here you have this kind of realist uh, art of extreme virtuosity with a particular interest in making it Norwegian through, through the character that he's shown. In other words, it's a character in Norwegian, recognizable Norwegian costume, a rural character with a Norwegian costume. So always, always with these artists, they're looking for something that makes their landscape art not just great landscape art, but specifically Norwegian. They're looking for a language, and they very often find it through what they paint um, in a naturalistic way. But um, Munte is particularly interesting, I think, because he moves into decorative art. And a lot of these artists change styles quite radically as they head towards the 20th century. And um, Munte becomes a, a, a designer of tapestries. That's what this is uh, from 1908 but also an illustrator. He designed furniture. Um, he's rather like, um, in Britain, I suppose, someone like Frank Brangwen. Um, and a, a very interesting kind of folk element comes into his work, which again reminds us, I think, of the development in Astrup's work, this uh, embracing of a folk style. Um, he worked as an illustrator on a very famous book in Norway, which is just called Snorri, and I've mentioned him already, Snorri Sturluson, the um, Icelandic saga guy. Um, there was a very beautiful kind of golden age um, illustrated book, uh, and uh, Munte collaborated with uh, Verun Sjölden um, on illustrating that, and it's a, f it's a famous book in the history of art in Norway. Very, very beautiful. Uh, that's where everyone's image of Vikings comes from, from that book, really. Oh, the wonderful Theodore Kittleson. Um, Kittleson, I, you know, watch this space. I'd like to do a show on Kittleson. Um, he is a great artist, but he's best known as an illustrator. But he is an interesting painter, too. And this is an illustration. I showed this because this is the Nocken. And um, I, w it's relevant because I mentioned the Nocken in the Astrup show uh, with the picture of the white horse in the landscape. Because the Nokan is a water sprite, a creature from the Black Lagoon here, um, who comes out and turns into a beautiful white stallion. So that's the same creature. It becomes a white stallion, then jumps back in the water and drowns you, because apparently you can't resist climbing on its beautiful back. Um, so that's, that's what this is. But actually, Kittleson is the person who really defines what all of those Norwegian folk tales uh, look like. So if you want to know what a, a troll looks like, go to Kittleson. And I can, you can do so with this book. I've just brought it in. It's in Norwegian. But if you want to look at the illustrations, that's what trolls look like. <laughs>
and Kittleson is the person who does it. But also note this. This is Kittleson, um, grain poles. And uh, we've seen grain poles from a great distance where they look like an army. They've been coming closer as you move into realism. And then as you get towards the end of the century, suddenly people notice that they look like people. And you start getting these kind of paintings where, where the grain poles appear to be shuffling off into the wood. And then Astrup merely adds a face and turns them into a troll. So he's not, he's not unique in that. So we move on to one of my very favorite, one of the greatest Norwegian artists. This is Erik Verenskjold. And uh, you can see that some of the elements, uh, obviously, of what Munter was doing, the beautiful landscape, um, but the, the characteristic elements of the landscape, the farmstead in the background, the fence in the foreground, which is for drying uh, grass. Um, you, you dried grain on poles to keep it away from the damp earth, but you dried grass on a, 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 a split fence like this. And so you see these fences, little short, you know, if you thought there were fences, they clearly weren't fencing anything in. That's because they're not. They're there to dry grass on. And they were, were a very characteristic feature of the Norwegian landscape. And you see them from the very first painting in Astrup. Look out for them. I bet you're thinking they're fences. They're not. It's for drying grass. And there you have, uh, again, uh, characters in very specific Norwegian costume. And if you think kilts are specific, Norway just is beyond that. If you're wearing the wrong kind of embroidery in a village in Norway, it's a big mistake. Every district has its costume, and you're not allowed to wear it if you're not from that district. I went to a concert um, in Bergen while I was over there once, and um, the lady was playing, she was playing Grieg, of course, and uh, she stood up at the end, and she was wearing national costume. And you know, one kind of thought, oh, that's very nice. And then she announced herself she was in Yelster costume. So she was wearing the right costume for Astrup. She was thrilled that we were doing the exhibition. Here is one of the greatest paintings of the 19th century anywhere, I think, I personally. Um, Berenschold, Peasant Burial. Um, it's, it's so beautiful. Of course, it's a sentimental Victorian subject, but it is not drenched in, in sentimentality as, as perhaps Christian Krogh might have done. He would have played it to the hilt. This is very um, restrained and very, very moving in the foreground, but what makes it so extraordinary is the landscape in the background, which is moving in itself. It's, it's so peaceful and so um, sad, I think, in, in terms of the mood. But again, it's this idea of mood, which I'm, you, we use an awful lot in Astrup. He's, he's focusing on mood, and, and this is what he means by it. He's not... He's not inventing something. He's coming out of a stream of artists who really are evoking not just the look of a landscape, but the, the, the sense of it being home and of it being having a kind of melancholy all of its own, which seems to be a particularly Norwegian thing. I think this is worth going to Oslo for on its own. And now we get to Christian Skresvig, who is also um, a, a big name, classic. Uh, uh, Norwegian painter, slightly more pedestrian, I think, than, than Verenskjold, in my opinion. I haven't seen enough, really, to say that, but yes. He's of that 1850s generation, like Verenskjold and um, Kittleson, that kind of person. And he's a perfect model. Again, he studies with Eckersberg, then he goes to Copenhagen, then he goes to Munich, then he goes to Paris for several years, then he returns to Norway and buys a house in one of the most picturesque areas called Egedal, and uh, in the Sigdal district, and um, Kittelsen moves nearby, incidentally. And you can still visit their houses. They're open to the public, and the Skresvik house is particularly beautiful. Um, it's open to you by his granddaughter, shows you around, and it still has his studio and all the rest of it. It's a, it's a really lovely um, artist's house. And he's very highly regarded in, in Norway, particularly for this painting, The Willow Flute. Um, which, as you can see, has that um, melancholy aspect to it. But notice how suddenly an artist is looking down. He's, he's, he's not having the mountains like Dahl would have had. He's cut it off, and he's looking down at the water, and it's the reflections of the sky and the water, and the very characteristic um, little boy playing the willow flute that, that is the subject matter. But it's a rather 
ordinary um, landscape in a way, but very Norwegian. And it brings us to another of the most important themes uh, in Norwegian art, the summer night. And there's a famous room in the National Gallery in Oslo where this painting hangs. This is Elif Peterson again. Elif Peterson, I should say. Summer Night from 1886. And this happens in the 1880s when a group of artists um, effectively develop from the kind of realist school into what the, it's called kind of evocative painting and, and um, it's mood painting in the extreme. And again, look, they're looking down at the surface of the water. And what, what this painting is all about is the capturing of the summer night, this specific Nordic subject of the, the, the kind of midnight sun, as it were, these endless nights in summer, which have this stillness and, and particular reverberation in the, in the air, the, the reflection of the moon in the water. And the whole series of artists set themselves this amazing task of kind of capturing these particular beautiful landscapes, and they're amongst the most beautiful paintings from, from uh, the 19th century, I think, this sort of period of, uh, in the 1880s. Here's another one. Another fantastically good um, woman artist, Kitty Keeland, spelt wrong, incidentally, she doesn't have an E in the kitty, um, who studied with Hans Gude. This is again from 1886, a similar subject matter and a completely remarkable capturing of the tone and the, the feel of, of, of the summer night, the ch sort of slight chill in the air and very dark mountains. And you can look at this and then go in and look in the first room of the Astrup show and you see a similar thing. The, the famous June night painting, the biggest painting in that first room, which has the mountains in dark silhouette against a kind of bone pink sky. He is doing the same thing. Kitty Keeland again, um, Jaren, choosing to paint an area of Norway that is almost deliberately not picturesque. In other words, she did this on the recommendation of Hans Gude, who thought that she would do justice to this particular area. These square paintings, of course, are peat diggings. This is an area where you dug up peat for, for your fires, and that's what these funny little pyramid shapes are. But um, she is a wonderful, wonderful painter, and sadly, um, she lived with Harriet Backer for many years, but um, eventually uh, she suffered from senile dementia. Um, so she stops painting, which is a great tragedy, but Kitty Keeland, wonderful artist. Fritz Taulow, worth mentioning because he's really the nearest that Norway gets to a, an Impressionist. Um, this is Abbeville. He, he lived in, in France and uh, he becomes this, he has two wonderful, wonderful tricks. He paints water wonderfully, as you can see. I mean, he's, he's the great uh, artist of, of tumbling streams. He also paints snow very beautifully, so you know, the, the, you've hit the jackpot with Fritz Taulo if, it's, if there's a stream tumbling through a snowy landscape, you know, you just can't get better than that. But he uh, trained with Gouda again, and he's one of the earliest painters to go to Skagen. Um, actually, with Christian Krogh, they sailed over. That's how close Skagen is to Norway, because it goes up north into the sea there. Um, uh, Taulo was able to sail there in his little boat with Christian Krogh. And he becomes one of Norway's most famous painters, although he, he effectively moved to Paris and died there in 1905, but he's kind of covered in honors in Norway. So every major collector that had an Astrup also had a Taulo on their walls. It's, he's an absolutely standard person. Now we move to, Beck, to Backer herself. This is the wonderful Harriet Backer who taught Astrup. And she paints um, interiors very beautifully. This is. Uh, She's interested in historic interiors, specifically Norwegian interiors, beautiful painted churches. This is a, a, a church, obviously a christening. Um, a very, I think it's a lovely painting, 1892. She's, she's a realist, but it's very much informed by, um, by Impressionism. And she lived in Paris for quite a long time, for 10 years, and uh, is a highly sophisticated artist. And again, someone, someone, the capital S, should be doing a show on Harriet Backer. And the fact that Harriet Backer lived with Kitty Keelan means that um, you could actually do a show with the two of them together, which would be rather wonderful, I think. And here is a surprise. I mean, this is uh, Harriet Backer from 1889. Um, 
from Olven, it's called, and you can see how her influence would have directly fed into what Astro does with the June night. Um, it's a uh, this could almost be by Astrup. It's slightly looser, but what it shares with Astrup is a rejection of aerial perspective. In other words, um, this, this move away from the picturesque, from the great fjords and the high mountains and the wispy clouds. They move closer and closer over time as they move into realism and eventually focus on what's in front of you. And whether it's the pond in front of you or, or just a mountainside like this, it's, it's not picturesque, and it involves an awful lot of use of green because you're not, you're not using blue at all in there. So he learned a lot from Bakker. And just to bring us full circle, this is Solberg again. I think, again, one of the most beautiful paintings in the National Gallery in Oslo, very distinctive. And that's what happens in the 1890s. You get Solberg, Astrup, Munch becoming individual and distinctive and developing their own languages distinct from um, a kind of Norwegian school. They're, they're searching for something specific. But interestingly, they're, they're still searching for specifically Norwegian subject matter and ideas, but in their own style. That's the great development in the 1890s. And Solberg, with this wonderful carpet of flowers and the rather plain, sort of stained landscape, and the moon hanging there as a kind of vanishing point for the flower carpet in the foreground, is, is a marvelous artist, very difficult, difficult artist, like Munch was. And who's this? Well, this is the Midsummer Eve bonfire. And actually, all of those threads that we've seen throughout the 19th century, from Dahl onwards, up to Munch, up to Solberg, via Verenschuld, whom he admired very much, come together in Astrup. The subject matter, the specifically Norwegian subject matter, the sense of a, of a kind of um, particular mood, slightly disturbing mood in the landscape, the, the overwhelming sense of the mountains, the fjord, the smoke, the bonfire. Um, the figure on the right uh, in, in costume, the Hardanger fiddle. It, it's all been seen before. This is something that is actually a culmination of Norwegian art history, not something unique. But he had, he is the only artist that I'm aware of who paints this particular scene. And as you've heard me say countless times, I'm sure, um, this comes from childhood memory, a specifically powerful childhood memory. Munch relies on childhood memory too, but it's one of the classic uh, ideas behind Astrup's work that he, he vividly remembers how he saw things as a child and wants to, to um, celebrate that, if you like. He's using his very sophisticated technique to kind of create something that chimes with how he remembers seeing things as a child. So when he has a memory like this where he was excluded by his father, from joining in in the Midsummer Eve celebrations because it was quite clearly pagan and furthermore fun. His father was a pastor, say no more. He didn't want his son being uh, involved in this and so of course it's seared on his memory and that's why Astrup devotes so much of his time to painting these bonfires. It's kind of an expiation of a, of a painful memory in childhood but also incredibly beautiful but not out of sequence with the rest of Norwegian art. And it brings us to where we began um, with Edvard Munch around 1900. Just to remind us that Munch is also part of the landscape story of Norwegian art, um, painting the Oslo Fjord here with a train going th through, reminding us of the smoke of Astrup. Um, he's looking for some of the same effects, but he does have this extraordinary individual rushy, painterly style and a choice of color that's all his own, but in the same way that Solberg has a choice of color that's all his own, and so does Astrup. It's in the air. Munch goes on, of course, to become the great international um, phenomenon, really. And 
now I think that's one of the reasons for doing this show is to indicate that Norwegian art doesn't begin and end with Munch. In fact, Munch is at the end of a very distinguished sequence of, of art in the 19th century, of which Astrup is equally um, a, a, a final point at the end of the sentence. So um, there you are, Norwegian art in a nutshell. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.